Leadership is a journey from me to we. Establish a unifying and enduring vision often referred to as a portrait of a leader. It's about creating an ecosystem in which people are secure enough and empowered enough to express uncomfortable views without being afraid of raised brows. So what is school leadership beyond education management? May I introduce the elite panelist for this session? <coughs> we extend a gracious welcome to Dr. N. Maithili Sastri, Associate Professor, Mahindra University, Hyderabad. We also have Mr. Anthony McKay, President and CEO, National Center for Education and the Economy, Washington, DC. Joining him, we have Mr. Michael Stevenson, Senior Advisor, OECD. I extend a hearty welcome to the moderators of the session who would take the discussion forward. We have Dr. Ruchi Sait, Principal, Lotus Valley International School, Noida. We have Ms. Seema Jarrett, Principal, DLF Public School, Ghaziabad. Ms. Richa Sharma Grihotri, Executive Member, NPSC and Principal Sanskriti School, had kindly consented to be the coordinator of the session. Over to you, ma'am. Good afternoon and welcome to this last session of the conference. It's a pleasure to have on our panel three very experienced and celebrated educators. We have with us Mr. Anthony McKay, a leading voice in global education. He has advised organizations, governments, and school systems on every continent. Mr. McKay, I found your paper on the future of educational leadership, the five signposts, very relevant and absorbing. And I would want to recommend it to everybody. And we really look forward to some great learning from you today. Thank you. Our second panelist, Mr. Michael Stevenson, is Senior Advisor, OECD. Mr. Stevenson is responsible for creating the long-term roadmap for the PISA. We are hoping, sir, that we can look forward to having you create a roadmap for India's principles as well. Happy to have you with us today. Our third panelist is Dr. N. Methli, a dear friend and head of Department of Education at Mahindra University, teaching doctoral students. Dr. Methli is one of the few researchers working on school leadership in the Indian context. She is well known to all of us as the co-creator of the Pedagogical Leadership Handbook for Leading Learning in Schools. Dr. Methli, the experiment that began in March 2020 has had outcomes and the pedagogical leadership training has so far been cascaded down to 25,000 CBSE school principals, 661 Jawahar Navodhya Vidyalayas and 1,245 Kendra Vidyalayas. Uh, coming to the session today, I think we've had eight sessions so far and there have been rich dialogues in all those sessions, which have clearly brought out one thing, that the ambit and expectations from school education are changing. The NEP2 emphasizes the need to overcome the cumulative learning deficit of students in India. India will have the highest population of young people in the world over this decade. And our ability to provide high quality education opportunities to them will determine the future of our country. Therefore, a new form of leadership is urgently needed to rethink our educational systems in a post COVID environment. And the onus of bridging these existing gaps is on all of us here, the school leaders. School leaders who can lead the school pedagogically and not just as administrators or managers. Never before, has the emphasis on improving student learning been so high as being witnessed today? And the school leader happens to be the second most important factor for improving student leadership. Learning, I'm sorry, student learning. I want to tell all our panelists here that most of our NPSC principals here are experienced and we are adept at juggling complex responsibilities. But there's a lot on the table for the educators today and we look forward to your diverse perspectives in helping us pave the way for this new India that's in the making. So 
to begin with the lady, may I invite you, Dr. Maitley, first to share your perspectives on the subject. And I think for 10 minutes now, the stage is all yours. Uh, could you unmute yourself, Dr. Methley, if you could just unmute yourself? Yeah. Thank you, Seema, for a wonderful introduction of the session. So I'm going to begin my presentation with a, a, a presentation with a PPT. I, I think I'm visible now with a PPT. Yes, ma'am, you are. Okay. So... Um, Mm -hmm. It's not moving. It's moved. We've yeah. got the same. Yeah. Okay. So as you rightly said, um, good afternoon to all of you. I was worried about the time. <laughs> good afternoon to all of you. And uh, it's a pleasure and it's a privilege for me to have uh, met uh, uh, Mr. Tony Mackey and Michael Stevenson on this. And uh, it's uh, really a uh, you know, wonderful memory for me to take back, uh, having been, I mean, being with you all on the panel. Uh, and also thank you in PSC for this occasion. And so as you rightly said, why school leadership? School leadership is the second most important factor constituting 25% of the total effect on student learning. We all know that now India reverberates on this two very important findings which have been globally accepted. And that's thanks goes to the government of India, which initiated these programs through putting up, putting it up in 12th five-year plan in, uh, uh, you know, way back in 2014. So what does it do? It, it creates conducive conditions for all stakeholders in the school through collaboration, coordination, networking, et cetera, and sets the direction for overall school improvement through vision, mission goals and what and such other leading processes. Creates an overall purpose of for teaching learning process in the entire school. Now, therefore, it also leads to innovations to turn around schools from the low base and also to move from good to great schools. <clears throat> okay, so what is this school leadership beyond the management? I argue in this presentation that it is not only about values, vision, mission, goals, but it is also about aligning the values with the vision and the goals. What does it mean for us? In Indian context and uh, with the school education system, it is the alignment of vision, values, vision and goals with respect to school as an institution and with respect to education system and also at the individual level as school leaders. And for, uh, as examples I took and wrote, um, you know, as we values at the school institution level, transparency, fairness, developing ownership, and then achieving excellence as a vision for the school and accountability as one of the goals towards reaching this. And then uh, at the education system level, it is about equity and diversity as a value and equal, equitable quality of education for all as a vision and every student must to learn as a goal. And at the individual level, it is about taking responsibility for actions and having a personal mastery as vision and all around development of students as the goal. Now, to give an analogy on this, I was trying to look at how do I bring home this point of alignment? I could very well see, I could see that we, the connect between, um, connect with the solar system that we are living in today. And that is, there are so many planets in the solar system and sun is at the center and no two planets are colliding with each other. They revolve around the sun and they also rotate around their axis. Now, how does it happen? It happens through that subtle alignment which we, which we are not able to see. And that is where the question lies. How do this alignment happen? And without this alignment, can we really call this as a solar system? That's the whole, whole approach to seeing what is leadership beyond management. And therefore, that, that critical aspect of alignment is, is very, very important for all of us to know and put in practice as leaders of the school. 
And therefore, to ponder the question now, we are all engulfed and, you know, um, thick uh, with activities that we do day in and day out as leaders. Please ponder over the question, is leadership in action alone? I leave it to you to move to the next uh, thing. Therefore, again, you try to look at it with that question ringing in your mind. On this statement, we are all one, but different. Different, but the same. What does it indicate to us? So this again takes us back to saying, when we are all one, but different, takes us to the diversity and inclusivity. Different, but the same, takes us to equality, equity, fairness and justice, isn't it? Then how should, once again, it comes back to, uh, uh, you know, first um, argument that how should the alignment of values, vision, goals happen in our schools? And where should it happen? If we have to locate school as a site, should we have to locate education system as a site of this alignment? Or should we have to locate individual as the site of this alignment? Or all the three? That is the, that is the question. So I would argue that it is not in the silos of the school as an institution or look at it a education system as a system and individual as a individual, or the leader as an individual, but then it is between and among these three critical institutions per se person as a leader, as an institution, school as an institution and education system that the alignment of values, vision and goals has to happen. So moving further, therefore it takes us to asking what is culture? Culture is about the visible signs and also the invisible causes that happen through the environment and behavior as the visible signs and the values and the attitudes, fundamental assumptions and beliefs that we hold and that we unconsciously or unconsciously put into our actions and practices in the schools, in the education system, and also at our individual levels, the uh, day in and day out. And therefore it is the way we do things around here. And therefore it takes us to the culture of the school or the school culture. What is that school culture? It is about the implicit ways in which the notions, beliefs, understandings and the purpose of teaching and learning process are shaped in everyday life of the school through the agency. I would emphasize this word through the agency of the leaders such as principals, teachers, school management committees, and community leaders. Okay, and where do we see this? How, how do we see this alignment? And here, I bring in this concept of cultural iceberg. Cultural iceberg, you know, there's a, there's a thin horizontal line, black line that you see with this iceberg. There is a formal overt system with us with which we work. It is in terms of the goals that we set, the technology that we use, the structure that we put in place in the schools and the education system, so the systems that we design to achieve these goals, and also about the policies that we formulate and implement in our schools and education system and at our personal levels as well. And there is this financial resources and so on and so forth. And therefore it is the way we say that we get things done. This is the formal overt aspects of the, uh, the culture that we see on one hand. And there is also another informal covert aspects to it. And it is about beliefs, assumptions, perceptions, attitudes, feelings, uh, such as anger, happiness, etc., that shape the formal and informal systems that we design as individuals within the organizations, within the system. And it is more, the more the informal, 
the more the belief systems, assumptions, and perceptions that are prevalent may be positive to the growth of the organization and the system, or may be deterrent to the growth of the organization and the system. And here comes, therefore, the values, the informal interactions, and the group uh, norms, which are hidden deep beneath the formal overt aspects. And hence, it is not the way we say that we get the things done in the overt uh, aspects of the culture, but it is about the way we really get the things done. And that's culture. And where have, where have we to work for the alignment of the vision, the values, and the goals? It is, it is more on this covert informal aspects and the way we really get the things done rather than the way we say that we need to get the work done. And therefore, here we see that beneath the iceberg is a lot that we need to do as leaders to move beyond the management. Therefore, what determines the learning culture? Trying to articulate for the purpose of the practitioners, the uh, esteemed leaders who have gathered here. And what can we see? It is about the interaction between the said beliefs and notions and unsaid beliefs and notions on one hand. The unsaid expectations and the said expectations, when they interact, we have the observable behaviors and the embedded attitudes beneath these observable behaviors. The, 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 the complexity of the interaction that determines the learning culture, right? And this determines the, the, actually the alignment of values, vision, and the goals between the education system, the school as an institution, and the leader as an individual or the person. So at all three levels, we need to look at these alignments. Therefore, and then why learning culture? Why do we need this culture? It is given to us from the larger society. Most of these beliefs, assumptions, notions. The norms are set because of the education system that drives us uh, with its policies, mostly. But then, why do we need this learning culture? At any level, be it at, at the education system level, at the personal level, or at the institution level of the school, it has the power to create new beliefs, norms, values, and expectations for transforming schools and the education system, and also to transform ourselves as individuals. And therefore, it is also about facilitating the leaders, leadership teams, students to engage meaningfully and innovate for learning. And here, I would like to say that I cannot but appreciate, and I was so much seeing in tune with the innovation sessions that were happening in the morning, about innovations in education and the innovative pedagogies that preceded this session. All these are talking about covertly, not overtly, covertly about the alignment. All the speakers were speaking about this alignment to bring about the alignment between the values, the vision, and the goals to transform the system, to transform the schools, to transform the learning of the children, and to transform the way that the children look at themselves, and also the teachers, right? And hence, we ponder again, is a school's learning culture equal to implementation of tasks and activities in a school? Moving, therefore, now, how to develop a learning culture? You are all familiar now with the pedagogical leadership. The lens is here about practicing the pedagogical leadership. And I would not dwell more on it because it is on your desks, it is on your tables, and hence I move further. We have used these six to seven descriptors to really see how can we align that vision and goals and with the values across the systems. And therefore, what does leadership beyond management in retrospect mean to us? 
Leadership beyond management is ever evolving, dynamic, culturally relevant, and contextually cognizant. Learning, unlearning, and relearning at the heart of leading processes rather than being task oriented. And therefore, culture begins with beliefs and finds expression in behaviors. And hence, ponder again the result of unchanged complexity is instability. With this, I, try, I wish to conclude by continuing this, what does school leadership beyond management mean for us? It is about what drives the actions in the form of alignment of <laughs> values, vision, and goals that is beyond the visible actions by questioning assumptions, notions, attitudes, and beliefs prevailing in our schools and education system overtly or covertly for leading learning. And thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Methley. I'm sure your, your concept of cultural iceberg is going to resonate a lot with the audience. And with that, I invite my colleague, Dr. Ruchi Seth to take the con con conversation further. Thank you, Seema. Um, uh, Dr. Methley, I must congratulate you for that pedagogical leadership document that you have brought out, which has become now, uh, I think every school leader has gone through every page of that document. And the training that has gone along with it makes gives us a very empowering experience. So that's one of the educational reforms that the CBSE has mandated, that every school leader should now become a pedagogical leader. And on that note, let me uh, welcome Mr. Anthony McKay. It's my great privilege to have you here, Anthony. We've been uh, exchanging mails and messages, but getting to see you in person is great. I really wish we could have you here in India to speak to us. Uh, you have such a vast experience. You've been connected with educational systems, uh, learning systems for a long period of time, and you worked with some of the most coveted organizations. Uh, if I may say, just name just a few, OSID, GELP, UNESCO, CSE, and ACER, just to name a few. And presently you hold the coveted position of president and CEO of National Council for Education and the Economy. You have, in your illustrious uh, career, you have advised organizations, governments, and school systems in, as Seema said, every continent and many countries. You've contributed to educational research and you have advocated for large-scale reforms. Today, as we live in an age of disruption and hyper-change, we've seen the pandemic, all of us have experienced it. We've seen resulting inequalities. We've seen children who have, were out of school growing more in numbers in that sector. We all have experienced climate change and the resultant disruptions, radicalism, geopolitics, aggression, conflicts. And we can't say enough that when one section of society gets affected. Somewhere in the world, other people also get affected. So in this kind, these changes with far reaching consequences on the human condition, the most important agent to alter this change is education. I'm making a case for an urgent need for effective value-based leadership. I think Dr. Methley has already spoken and touched upon aligning the goals and visions of a school, of the school with the leader. But we want, you, you've written on those five signposts that you, uh, on that article that you've written. Could you give us a roadmap of, ahead and tell us about the reconfiguration of educational leadership with the opportunities and challenges if we want an educational renaissance? Over to you. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. That is such a wonderful introduction <laughs> and uh, superb presentation that's come before this contribution. But um, the way in which you have 
set up the contribution that I want to make is completely perfect. You've said we are living in an age of disruption and hypertension. Uh, and you've said that we need to have a learning system that will attend to the huge challenges that we face. We need to be able to look after ourselves, each other, and the planet. Absolutely. <laughs> and our learning system must serve that purpose the purpose of uh, the sustainability of we as humans. So it's a very big task that we have before us as school leaders. So the fact that you've positioned this conversation in the way that you have, that is beyond management, school leadership for the kind of world that we want to have. And as Michael will say, school leadership in order to flourish. Yes. in order to thrive. thrive. <laughs> I mean, that, that thing gives us a sense of what the big purpose is. And when Valerie and I produced the paper that you've referred to and talked about five signposts, it was exactly to do what you've outlined, namely, how can we point the direction that we need to take? Could there be a way of saying that in addition to all of the competencies and all of the qualities and all of the tasks that leadership have. And here we are with many, many school leader colleagues. There's a huge expectation. Are there a number of signposts that will help us as school leaders? And we've identified five, and I'll mention them very briefly. Uh, the first, we've talked about um, leadership that can create uh, an, a shared narrative a new narrative around the purpose for learning. Now, I'm not going to say anything more on that than the introduction I've already given because Michael will talk about the importance of learning systems to encourage the flourishing of all of us. And you've talked about all of us in the sense of the importance of equity, of inclusion, of recognizing diversity. I'll come back to that. But certainly, Leaders do need to be in the business of creating a powerful story about why we need to change the way in which we think about our schools and what we think about in terms of our purpose. So I'll leave that one. Uh, Michael, I'm sure you'll, you'll come in on that, on that theme. The second is we've talked about leading within an ecosystem. Now, I know ecosystem language is sometimes awkward, but perhaps I could put it this way. Our leadership certainly is of our own school. And then it certainly is leadership shared across schools that we cooperate with. And it's leadership in our communities. That is the communities of our young people, our parents. But it's also leadership of the wider ecosystem. We know there are so many people who can support young people's learning. And we've got so many potential partners. And it's not just a question of making sure now at a time where we know young people are struggling in so many ways, uh, as a result, not just of the pandemic, but of the pressures of life, then obviously there are many others that can support young people's learning, social, emotional, as well as cognitive. And then there's the business community, there's civic leaders, there's other agencies. So I think we need to think about our school leadership as connecting to what you might call is an ecosystem. And if we all work together, if learning is everybody's business, we think we've got a far better chance of being able to ensure that all young people will emerge from school uh, with a sense of wanting to continue to learn and having all of the, all of the characteristics that have been mentioned uh, throughout many of the previous sessions. Third, can we lead for equity? You've already raised the question of equity as being absolutely crucial. If we are not able to think about equity in an enlarged sense, I know that we are increasingly talking about equity that ensures that all young people, no matter what their backgrounds, no matter what their socioeconomic conditions, no matter at what level of risk they might be or disadvantage, no matter what their race or their gender or their creed, 
how do we ensure that equity is at the heart of the leadership that we exercise? Because if we can't ensure that we have both individual and social equity, it's going to be a very, very difficult, difficult world for us and it won't be sustainable. <laughs> so that kind of leadership to take on the responsibility for promoting and enabling equity is crucial. Next, leadership for innovation. The argument here is that it's not simply to suggest that all of the ways in which we are currently working are somehow outdated, but it is true that some of them are, and we should be constantly leading to innovate, not just do things better and faster, but to do things differently. Because if we don't think about experimentation, and I mean responsible experimentation, then our capacity to be able to support young people's learning, all young people, for what I'm talking about here as being a very clear purpose, an enlarged purpose for learning, and working in cooperation and partnership with others, working for equity, we will need to be leaders of innovation to ensure that we can achieve the kind of outcomes for all young people that we desire. And finally, we've talked about uh, leading for uh, futures literacy. Now, another way of putting this is that it's not enough for us to be only operating within a time horizon of a couple of years. We as leaders need to be able to anticipate the future because we want to ensure that we are preparing all of those people within our school communities for the changes that are going to be continuously disruptive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and therefore, True. how can we think about the trends, the scenarios? I'm not talking about predicting the future or forecasting the future. I'm talking about attempting to anticipate the future. And there are many ways in which we can use futures literacy to do that. One, one way in particular is to think about time horizons. And so I've mentioned a time horizon that might just be a three to five year time horizon. But I think all of us now want to anticipate further time horizons. And we want to think about the way in which we can craft our own leadership to support uh, our fellow professionals, young people, parents, uh, community members, in order to think about how a future can be one that we think will serve the whole person, that we believe will actually be, as Michael has said, for human flourishing, or if you like, for sustainability. So just to say again, co-develop the narrative is a signpost for the kind of leadership that we think we need. Certainly engaging with the ecosystem is another direction that we think that leaders should take uh, in order to ensure that we have the right outcomes for all young people. Certainly be committed to responsible experimentation. Think about a campaign that's going to drive equity and enlarge concept of equity. And certainly commit ourselves to anticipating the future that will help all of us to be able to live far more sustainably uh, not only today, but into uh, a future that we know is going to be very challenging for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. That was very crisp, but it gave us a roadmap for the future. And uh, before, uh, in, in, in fact, instead of wasting more time uh, on questions, I think I'll go straight to Michael because we're running short of time. Michael, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I think both of you know each other and you've done work together. You've also got a vast amount of experience in international organizations and agencies. Uh, you've been with the NCEE where Anthony is now. You've been with BBC, Cisco, and presently you are senior advisor to OSED. Um, you have a deep understanding of the shifting par paradigms in education, and you have been providing a roadmap. You did it for PISA, and you have been advising governments and uh, other agencies, uh, school systems, on what to look out for in the future. So could you tell us that uh, 
for leaders like us who, who are committed to mission-oriented teaching, but sometimes we really don't have very much clarity. Sometimes we lose our way. What is the way forward for us? We're all looking to hear from you on, uh, on the insights that you can give us on the new orientations and the new set of competencies, one of which I think Anthony already said, maybe the overarching competency or, or the uh, focus of the future, which would be human life for flourishing, education for flourishing. So over to you, Michael. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. And um, thank you for that very kind introduction. Really picking up on what Tony said, I want to speak about the purposes of education, which I think have been stable or certainly familiar for a very long time, but maybe we're at a moment of potential transformation. And if the purposes of education are important, they're important at every level of the educational endeavor. Um, certainly in the classroom itself and within the school, but there has to be a license to rethink those purposes that comes from the top of systems, from ministers, from civil servants, that's how education works. And at the OECD, um, I've had the chance over the last three years and will over the next three years to think hard with some of the world's top performing education systems about changing purposes. Uh, the work has begun with five small and beautiful systems, British Columbia in Canada, um, Estonia, Finland, the Nordics, uh, but also Hong Kong and Singapore. The work will move forward, adding to those five, um, Australia, Germany, and the United Kingdom. Uh, all of those countries committed at the highest level, their most senior officials, the ones with long-term responsibility, all of them talking together. Um, about the purposes of education and why they might need to change. In the 20th century, really in countries around the world, particularly as they've got more prosperous, the central purpose of education, hasn't it, has been to prepare people for the labor market. That's what it has been about um, uh, covertly, if not always overtly. The thought was, can countries and their education systems develop enough people with increasingly knowledge economy uh, characteristics to meet the demand um, for an educated people driven by ever increasing technology advances? That's been the drive, though a nice to have has always been to narrow the economic gaps between people within the labor force. Well, after those policies began to wobble in the late 1970s, countries in the around, around the world have adopted a very similar kind of education strategy to meet the need. Uh, it's been about STEM problem solving within a broader curriculum. Um, it's been about equity, hoping that everybody can come through whatever their background, and it's been about the expansion of higher education. Well, how did all of that go? <laughs> well, um, if um, greater prosperity was part of that purpose, we have seen it uh, right around the world. We have seen greater prosperity um, in our times, not least in bringing uh, people from poverty um, in developing countries to better standards of living. We haven't seen much of a difference in equity. In fact, we've seen the gaps widening dramatically. And if we have become prosperous, we've done it at the expense of the planet. We've made deep inroads into the planet's resources. And I think as people have recognized increasingly in recent times, but Michael Sandel at Harvard has been foremost in this, education has kind of been a handmaiden of some of the problems. If you were an academic child, um, you could pick your way through school, university, and ever narrowing gates, and you would be sorted 
by employers into top jobs. But what if you weren't one of those children? You're on the other side of the tracks. And maybe it's many of those who haven't found a way forward in education um, and who are bitter um, and who have seen their, their fortunes falling, um, who have become most likely to support populist movements um, around the world um, to the detriment of our political cultures. So all of that points us towards something we call education for human flourishing. This time around, as we rethink education, it's got to work for everyone. And we've got to help reorient individual lives and put the planet and our societies back into balance. And there's one other reason why that might be important, which is less discussed. And that is simply that what lies ahead of us is the age of the machine. Well, people have been talking about that for a long time, but machine learning at the heart of artificial intelligence is going to make a transformational difference to economies, to societies, and to individual lives over the years ahead. Um, we can already see it happening. Um, it is accelerating automation and flinging more people out of work. It's the algorithm that's making our choices for us as consumers, what color shirt shall I buy? Um, and as voters, where should I put my cross? in the ballot box. And as you begin to think about the cumulative impact of all of that, then maybe AI will also undermine our very identity, our sense of what it is to be a human, um, our sense of um, being the people in charge of our own destiny using the full array of what we have, our minds, our bodies, um, and our emotions. Um, and there too, therefore, Maybe if we're thinking about human flourishing, we'll need to figure out the intelligence that humans can cultivate that machines won't. And um, there's good reason to think that as humans, um, our intelligences may, yes, be higher cognitive intelligences, though machines are getting after us every day, but also social intelligence, the ability to work with others, and meta-intelligence the profound ability to reflect about ourselves as learners and humans. So for those two reasons, a world in crisis after the 20th century mass industrialization and knowledge economy and the coming era of AI, that's why we might think about education for human flourishing. Um, so to be very quick and say what that might mean, um, well, firstly, an orientation, um, the orientation that learners might have. How do they feel about all of this? Well, Tony's talked about some of this and we think it may be not only future readiness, not only future literacy, but um, a capacity to transform as we look out over the next 50 years to transform ourselves and through systems-based awareness to transform our societies and our, our world. Uh, and here we work closely at the OECD with Otto Sharma um, at MIT and his Presencing Institute and his remarkable work on Theory U, the personal transformation journeys that leaders might make and indeed learners might make to set themselves up to drive the change that the 21st century will need. We thought about competencies, um, competencies that combine knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes. And we thought about assessment for those competencies that isn't simply about pushing young people into the school gymnasium once a term, once a year, or for PISA once every three years, and seeing in a snapshot what they can recall, but is much more um, formative assessment, which is rigorous, uh, which is integrated and above all useful. It allows young people to tell the world what they can do. We thought about three competencies in particular, all of which we think will be central, which we think will draw upon the human intelligences, not the artificial ones. And in a way could take us back to Aristotle and to other thinkers of the ancient world. Um, Aristotle, who thought that the flourishing life would be moral, reason infused, 
conferring a sense of meaning and significance, um, allowing contemplation and building awe, awe at a remarkable world um, from a gorgeous sunset to looking through a microscope at the crystal. We thought of, therefore, adaptive problem solving, not just problem solving, but the ability to transfer what you learned in the last problem to the next one. Machines can't do that, not yet at least. We thought about ethical decision making um, based on metacognition, that sense of perspective, which allows us to recognize the needs of others, the needs of societies, of the world, um, and of ourselves in reaching difficult decisions, um, not political decisions necessarily, but certainly ethical decisions that touch on how we should behave in a difficult setting. And thirdly, we thought about aesthetic perception, that ability to judge what is fine and necessary and beautiful. Um, and uh, to do that in a very personal way, it's not, can you recite the top 50 paintings in the Western canon of portrait art. It's how can you see the spiritual value in the world around you and all the artifacts um, and all the natural phenomena that make our world a wonderful place. So that's where we're headed with this work, the High Performing Systems for Tomorrow work. And we recognize, and I just want to end by acknowledging Tony's thinking, three system trajectories that would enable it, um, equity, you can't talk about human flourishing and accept that about a third of those who go through our school systems are cast aside. This must be for everybody. Um, and maybe as much as equity, we should th be thinking about opportunity. We're not simply looking to allow every child to get to the same foundational literacy benchmarks irrespective of background. That's letting every child get to the same thing. What about letting different children get to different things through differently sculpted learning opportunities? The second trajectory is actually to make use of these AI-based education technologies, which are remarkable, as we know, and allow people to learn through rich video-based experiences, profound concepts that underpin disciplines, rapid feedback, adaptation to where you are in the learning journey. Um, that's what AI technologies can do for us. And finally, again to Tony, the ecosystemic direction. Um, surely if we're to provide better learning opportunities for everybody through life that play to all of those different dimensions of the human being, we will need to capitalize on all of the, our resources of every kind, not just those resources within the school. So those three trajectories, equity, AI-based education technologies, and ecosystems at system level, recognizing that it will be for policymakers to make the trade-offs between them, some of them very complex. If you're a policymaker trying to bring in new competencies and assessments, you'll think to yourself, I need grip on my system. But the ecosystem idea is exactly not about grip. It's about letting go and opening up to what everybody can bring into education. So that's the work. Um, we've called it Education for Human Flourishing. It'll move forward for a further three years as we develop detailed policy frameworks for countries that might want to go in this direction. And of course, for the OECD with its surveys, such as PISA, which again might draw on uh, these competencies these assessments and these orientations. Thank you very much for letting me share all of this with you this afternoon. Thank you so much, Michael. It's a very optimistic note that we are ending this session on because uh, talking about human flourishing when half the world is struggling to survive today, uh, maybe not half the world, it's an exaggeration, but uh, that's what education is about, isn't it? It's about giving hope and leading us towards that goal of uh, hopefulness. And uh, uh, so th I'd like to just uh, say a very, very big thank you to both the speakers, Anthony and Michael for uh, this. I don't know, Richard, do we have time for some questions? No, we don't. So thank you so yeah. much. I'm sorry, we'll have to sort of Over end the session you. now. Just we are already about 15 minutes. Uh, 
we've overshot. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Methili, uh, Anthony, and Michael for sharing uh, your thoughts. And ideally, we would have loved to had this session go on. And I'm sure all leaders have many things to talk about, but it's been an absolute delight and honor to host you. Thank you, Ruchi and Seema, for your moderation and for uh, coming in and adding your special touch to it. Thank you very much, everyone. And let's look forward to the validatory session. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Let me just, uh, let me just come in. I must thank uh, Mr. Tony uh, McKay. Uh, he's, it is, uh, I think, early morning, 4.30. He's sitting there for us. So I must oh. thank all the speakers for sparing their valuable time. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for giving the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, for this insightful session.